What you're about to see is a very advanced animation lesson. Before I get into that, I know that some of you watching this want the basics of animation covered and software. What I am going to do is link you to Bloop Animation. Go and check them out if you're interested in learning the basics and having a very solid knowledge of your software. I'm affiliated with them, so please consider that. I had a lot of fun breaking down Mitsuo Iso's work, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. On with the lesson. Okay, so I managed to extract this shot. So I'll just run through the clip and then we'll make some observations on it. <laughs> so first we've got her leaning in. If we look at the tip of this weapon here, it's kind of dragging behind. Meanwhile, this is moving forwards and then it kind of comes up. So it's kind of like, see where they touch here. Like what I was saying before, where there's only a very small amount of time that it spends on the actual impact before then just bouncing off. So then they go ping. It's a really cool display of energy and how they're, they're equals in their power. Like, so the, the weight is like so balanced. Some of the best fights are the ones where the two opponents are equally matched. The outcome is less certain if the two opponents are equally matched. And that's what's going on here. I like how this one actually, the end hits the ground here and kicks up big cloud of debris and, and dust and things. Okay, this bit is really interesting. So she brings it, kind of swings it around like that and it goes down. So it's going down. So then when it kind of ricochets, it goes upwards, swings upwards like that, and then back over her shoulder. Let's look at the footwork, because the footwork is always really difficult, I find it. Apart from that little step forward, maybe there, actually it's more of a lean forward. The feet have been fairly stationary, that foot has dragged up somewhat. But now, with this thing, this weapon is going way beyond her. And as you can see here, she can't account for that massive weight being so far off her center of balance. So she's got to take a step. And I really like how she controls this object, which is in a way too heavy for her to manage. So it kind of leans back and just kind of pushes it up or it kind of bounces up. And then we take these little steps. Right there, there's like a little step taking place. And I guess the reason why it's a little step is because all of this weight she's having to manage, the time in which there's a step here <clears throat> has to be very small because if it's a big step, the weight would kind of overcome her. So you need that time with the feet on the ground there. Just really nice how this is, how the weight is being displayed here. Now look at this, um, so for the hit itself, for the swing, when we got the swing in full momentum, it lasts about this many frames. And then about that many to make the main distance back. So about 12, a dozen frames to make the distance back. But now the the kind of shuffling around process before she can make another hit is from here all the way to here that that's how long it takes for her to gather more momentum to be able to change the direction and the speed of the weapon. And then this hit itself, we see that the cut is made on action. So we hit it and then we go closer in to see the damage that it's done. And I guess this shows something about the material. Despite its really heavy mass, it doesn't go all the way through. It just kind of gets 
stuck and kind of comes to a stop. <laughs> That's very, this is a very anime thing where there's no blood, there's no blood for a while and then bam, <laughs> the blood just <laughs> starts coming out. It's, it's very unique to Japanese culture, I think. Despite its realism in this scene, there are still a lot of the kind of anime tropes that make their way in. Basically, all the effort goes into just changing the speed and direction of this of this weapon. So it takes her that much time to get to be able to gain control over it to change it. Now, once it is, I would argue that around this point here, she stops having to make any effort because the momentum of this object is in motion now, and so it will just be unstoppable because of the weight that it's got. So here you can see that that's kind of, with this it's kind of easy, it's kind of more weightless. Don't really have to make much effort. All the effort was put into bringing it back round here. You know, this would operate on the same scale if it were two tiny figures fighting here, except for that when you scale them up to be this size, you have to slow the whole thing down. So so if I scrub through faster, let's see what it looks like and let's see what the scale looks like. Looks a lot smaller. It looks like they could be a lot smaller from that. So yeah, remember that when you, you're moving big, heavy objects with a lot of mass, just slow the whole thing down. Make sure that there's a lot of time for the speed and the direction to change. The other example I just wanted to quickly show you was this one, it's one of my favorites. By the way, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's a tank and when this weapon comes down, the tank is just kind of split in half, which I thought was a really nice little uh, touch of detail there. I also like this rock that comes out from here and it just starts spinning towards the camera. But anyway, this shot here, when it, plays it just looks so lifelike how the weight is works in this so i'm guessing that here's the handle in the middle or near the middle but actually this side of it has less size than this side so when it's spinning through the air like this this side comes down first and creates this really nice sort of bounce like that it's much more of an appealing movement than if both sides were to come down the same and for it to just do a roll like that, you know, and then just bounce over us. Instead, we've got this sort of lopsided bounce. It also adds lots of appeal. So the, the authenticity of this movement is also helping its appeal. He's still applying the principles of, um, of uh, animation here where you know, if you think about a bouncing ball, the ball spends a lot of time up at the height of its bounce, and then it spends less time going down on the bounce. And I think that's amplified also by the the placement of where the camera is. You see that it spends a lot more time in the air here at the height of the bounce, lots of time here, and then this part is fairly quick in comparison until it reaches the ground like just before it hits the ground that's the fastest it goes and as you can see he keeps on spinning it through the whole thing but the spin is also on its own sort of timing which is really interesting normally with something like this it would there would only be debris coming up this far when it flicks up when it's up at about that height but instead, just the impact of that bit hitting the ground, touching the ground there, already sends up this this impact debris. So I, I found that really interesting to, to look at. Camera work is quite, uh, quite nice here. It's a little bit sort of a, of a handheld style because the camera actually lags behind a little bit, you see? So it goes off to the left first. The camera doesn't follow it exactly, it goes off to the left first and then the camera goes and follows it and kind of catches up to it. And even on the camera movement itself, the camera kind of overshoots a little bit this way, which is a very appealing motion 
if you're using camera or if you're using object, um, it's kind of like in easing and let's say your motion is like that, <clears throat> that's 100% there. So when, when, it's, when the movement is done, it goes to 100% and it's something like that, where there's easing in and there's easing out. So that can be very appealing, but this can also be even more appealing when you push it, which is what he did just with the camera movement alone, um, let alone actually, uh, you know, with the things moving in front of the camera. So what you can do is you can actually push it past this like that. And that part there and there, that's it going backwards in anticipation. And this part here is kind of sh overshooting, or you might call it follow through. So you can push this easing even more. Um, you can also push it in other ways. You can push it so it goes like that. But I don't find that this one is nearly as good as this one in most cases because that part here, when we get too steep there, it just looks like it's, let's say uh, if we act this out on a, on a, an object, it would look like this. Now, because they get so far apart on this part here, it kind of looks, starts to look like they jump. So it looks like it just kind of teleports from this frame to this frame. So this method here, not always as effective as this method. They have different characteristics though. Um, you can really push this method, depends on what the mass is again, but I think for dealing with things with a high amount of mass where it's really heavy, really big, this method is, is better. And this is definitely um, the kind of principle that Mitsuo Iso has used in his uh, animation sequence here. So basically, this is kind of adding more complexity to an action. So we've got the primary movement here, which is lifting the knife object out. And all these debris is coming through and that's really nice as well. I like how they're all kind of going out in their separate directions because of the camera angle that we've got. It's not just a side on camera angle, it's actually shooting from below, which is a really cool angle to have. So then we bring it back on screen, this fist. One of the most common movements for secondary items that are far away from the body is a figure of eight movement. So when you've got uh, something like the elbow, that usually does maybe a circular movement, but then the one further down from that, because it's got two effectors, it's got the shoulder and the uh, elbow, that kind of has a ripple effect and it will create in the hand a figure of eight movement. Now this is speaking very generally, but this definitely applies to uh, walk cycles and run cycles and things like that. So here we're kind of, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's exactly a figure of eight movement because it is a very simple movement, but it is certainly a sort of circular pattern where he's going round, you see? See that? Going round like that. And then it kind of settles on the third phase of this. This is like the settling, but it's still kind of, it's still going that way, that way. This is building in really complex, information rich animation into your piece. I guess I've got to compare this to a bad example, but I'm not gonna compare it to any in particular. I'm just going to create a bad example. Uh, we could just draw a fist. Can't remember what exactly it was like, but. You, you might think, oh yeah, but no one does this. They do. At lazy animation, you see this all the time. So, and then it would just come back to like here, to there, and then for the in-betweens, we just go, just do a direct in-between, between those two. I'm doing this really fast, so it's, it's even worse. It's kind of a caricature of this uh, lazy animation method. And then we'll do another in-between, and we might ease it a little bit, but yeah, all right, we'll ease it. We'll, we'll ease it so that we just 
savor this part of it. So then let's just move these about on the timeline. So it'll just be like that. You see how that is not information rich animation. I'm using this term more and more now. And it's not displaying the weight very accurately or the, the nuanced behavior of that area of the, of the body. I'm gonna try and give you some advice so that you can add in more information to yours. So let's just look at this example one more time. Now, one method that I've seen to achieve something like this, I'm gonna just take this fist shape. Okay, so the next step, I've got this fist here. I'm going to remove the arm and just have it as an isolated object like this. Now, what I can do is I, I can create a symbol out of it or whatever, just so I've got access to it, I can move it around as much as I like. Um, I'm not gonna tween it because tweening is falling into the trap of this. Tweening will create these really boring, no more information is added to the animation. That's what tweening will create. I know that's a really terrible example, but just bear with me. We're gonna just move it about freely as we like on keyframes. So I'm gonna put onion skin on as well so I can see where it's come from, but I'm gonna move it in a way which is, uh, which has all of these arcs and these figure of eight motions in there. And hopefully it will make something that's much more interesting to look at. And then we can sort of join it onto the rest of the body. Now we can always redraw areas of this, but yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go back and tweak some of it. I think it moves too far back in that direction, so we're gonna just reduce that. We can just move them like this. See how we're adding a lot more complexity by not just going straight for the in-betweens on these parts. A little bit more labor intensive, but definitely worth it to add in that extra animation detail. We're not adding in detail with drawing, we're adding in detail with, with movement. And then we can start layering it, so we can start adding things like, you know, moving it about a bit, and then eventually we're gonna redraw this hand in different shots at different angles to get that angular change as well. I'm gonna space them out as well to add the kind of the weight that I want. It doesn't have to be perfect on your first pass. You can change it to be, you can make changes as you go along. Something like that. Because what I'm paying attention to there is that the the tip here, if, we, if we're looking at it from this, as it goes further away, that tip is going to lag behind the base. Sometimes what you want to do to um, to disrupt things a little bit is to just push a frame, a random frame, out from where it's meant to be. And sometimes that can create a, an amazing effect that you didn't even realize should be there. It should be settling down actually here. So I'm going to make the movement less erratic towards the end save that erratic movement right for the very beginning. A little bit better, a bit janky. You see, it will look a little bit, like, it, it will look a little bit less smooth. I mean, you can change that by adding in in-betweens into these bits which are spaced out, but it will oscillate a little bit differently to something which is tweened. The, the tweened stuff is very straightforward. There's there's very little that kind of, there's there's much less personality in it, in my opinion. All right, so let's now just, 
I'm gonna leave it there just so that it's faster. So now I'm going to just link on the other parts of it. This is one way to do it, by the way. You don't have to do it this way. There are other methods. Just kind of toning it down to be a bit less erratic these parts so yeah that's that's a quick demonstration of how you can build in more of these complex movements feels like Mitsuo Iso is using in this part at least for some of these shots for others I don't find that uh, it's that way at all so it really depends on what shot he's working on so yeah, I'm going to leave it there because I could talk about this uh, sequence all day. Um, yeah, I recommend you watch the film as well. It's, it's a really good film. Of course, check out my website, animatorguild.com. Have a look uh, for my links in the description of this video. I provide a lot of interesting resources. Remember to check out Bloop Animations. See their tutorials and books that they have. The link is in the description for that. Also, there's a link in the description to my online store where you can buy some of my source files to look through. The source files also come with tutorials and stuff, so it'd be cool if you check that out as well. And of course, subscribe to the channel if you're new. All right, see you in the next video. Goodbye. What's gonna happen to that shape? Is it gonna be like a sheet of paper and, and go like, that is going to be completely flat, you know, it would give it away. So you've got to put in these things. You're going to have to put them in at some point when you're animating the character.